Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Smith, the hardworking committee up here on the stage. And I want to start out by saying this, that usually when we're called to introduce a candidate or whoever it might be, you usually get up and try to figure out what you can say about them and hope half of it is true. In the case of Scoop Jackson, and I'm not prejudiced because I'm wearing his pen and I happen to be vice president with my office in Seattle. But actually, Scoop, as he's known to all of us, has the only record that I can see of all candidates. That is, they all come and talk to us as labor people. They come and ask for our support. And we have to wonder. We have to wonder whether or not they have the ability or they would do what usually a politician promises during a campaign. I think in introducing Scoop, I want to leave this impression with you people. He has the proven record. For 35 years, he's been what we call in labor the best you can get. We've never had to worry. He's been with us all the time. And alongside of that and with that, he is also one of the greatest Americans I've ever known. With that, I want to introduce the junior senator from the state of Washington, Scoop Jackson. Thank you, Frank. General President Red Smith, officers, members of the Nonpartisan League. I like that nonpartisan. That ought to get them. Glad to see so many nonpartisan Democrats, and I'll make a nonpartisan Democratic speech. <laughs> Frank, I want to thank you for your generous comments. I'm very proud of my long record in labor. And you might put behind that 35 years that my father was in the labor movement for 50 years. He uh, belonged when you take your life in your hands to have a union card membership. You might say, Red, that uh, he worked in the Anaconda Smeller back in the 90s when they had a 12-hour day in a company store. And for... Fifty years, he was an officer in the building trades in my home county. I'm the only candidate in the history of our party who's running on the Democratic ticket for the nomination who comes from a long labor background. I mean genuine labor background. I'm very proud that I'm the only candidate who's had uh, the longest record in support of labor and that is in support of a great majority of American people that's running. Look at the record, as Al Smith said, and you'll see it, as Frank mentioned. It's there. We come from a great labor state. I heard one uh, aspiring candidate who never heard of, what, what do you mean by right to work? Never heard of it. In our state, we voted it down, didn't we, Frank, two or three times. The people. Labor has done a terrific job, and I'm proud of my escort committee, because in our state, our people, through the leadership of labor, through the years, and it had a bloody beginning, have been able to get their story to the broad majority of the electorate in a very successful way. What other states can point with that kind of pride on many occasions, voting down decisively the Right to Work Committee that took charge of the White House here not long ago. Something called, uh, was it Citus Piketty? And Mr. Ford came out and said, well, uh, it's true, I uh, agreed to sign the bill with the changes, and they made the changes. All the commitments were fulfilled, but I received 600,000 letters, so I had to change 
My God, what was he doing for 25 years on Capitol Hill? Is he going to allow mail and mail alone to determine how he should vote and how he should sign a bill? Now, that's the problem facing this country. And I hope Labor uh, will look at the issues hard and look at the candidates hard. And I'll put my record alongside any of them. I'm very proud of my long association with the machinists. We fought battles together. We've got a large membership in our state, over 40,000. We've fought the battles, and we've won a lot, and we've lost some. But I'm very proud of the leadership out of our organization. And I want to say to all members from all 50 states that I look forward to working with you. I want your delegates to sign up on our delegate slates. There's been a lot of misunderstanding. I think you ought to be careful, if I may say a word of caution, of being opportunistic and going along for someone who doesn't have a labor record, but going along for the sake of supporting someone against someone else, thinking you're going to stop somebody. If labor gets into that mood, they're going to have a hell of a time explaining it to their members. And those days of reckoning come. I want to work, and we are working with your group. We're very appreciative of the fine endorsement of the Machinist Council in the state of Massachusetts, where you have a large membership. And I hope that we'll get support elsewhere. I ask it only on the record. I only want it on the basis that you look your members in the eye when you're confronted later with a voting record of someone else who's 180 degrees off course. That's all I ask, is to lay it on the line and see where they stood. I was brought up the traditional labor rule that you reward your friends and you go out to defeat your enemies. And those who are not on either side, you ought to throw them all the way out of the place. I don't know how you feel. <laughs> labor should stop pussyfooting. You saw what happened with Ford. They all promised deals. But you better look at the past, and what is past is prologue, I submit to you. I was voting against Taft-Hartley. I've seen labor endorse in this campaign men who voted for Taft-Hartley. Think about it. You've got to face the record later. You've got to look at it. This has been a good, strong union, a capable union. You've never had a finer president than Red Smith. I mean that. Red has been through the battles and the wars, and they're tough. And I am proud of our long friendship. And I think it's important that labor understand we haven't won this election yet. We've gone through two catastrophes, and we're all paying for it. The great thing about the labor movement is that labor has supported the programs that have helped the entire American community. One of the things when I was in the House, and when I voted against Taft-Hartley in the House, and I voted to repeal it in the House, those are historic landmarks measures, but labor was fighting for social security, for the health programs, for the housing programs that helped the whole community, not just labor. I remember going back, <coughs> one of uh, my strong Republican opponents came up to me one day and he gave me a social security number. He said, Scoop, I'm getting ready for social security, and I'd like for you to find out how much I'll get. I said, why? I thought you'd turn it back, Bill. You're posed it all the way through. It's socialism. Oh, he says, it's, uh, things have changed a bit now, and I'm for it. And that's the way uh, the whole Republican administration, they opposed the Social Security program. Jerry Ford made a great speech on Medicare. 
How many Americans know that Gerald Ford voted against Medicare just a short time ago? He didn't learn anything. Against Medicare, even. And we had a long, hard fight. It passed in 65. We had close fight, Red, in 1960, almost passed it. But we had Eisenhower. He's against it, except at Walter Reed. <laughs> he was. He had the best system in the world. And members of Congress have it available, too. And I like it. It's great. I want it for all Americans, however. And we're putting out, I think, a very fine document tomorrow for the press, at least this evening at 6 o'clock, supporting the Kennedy-Corman bill and making suggestions, which I'll not go into at this time, that'll help to strengthen the bill <coughs> and to really tackle the most serious problem we face are the rising costs of Medicare. I mean the rising costs of all medical care. Do you know what's happened in the last six years? The cost of medical care in this country has doubled. It's now $118 billion. It's more than the defense budget. It's more than all the capital outlay by all of industry in this country annually. And may I say it's 8.3% of the entire gross national product. We've got thousands of beds that are not being utilized, and you, through your own health plans that have been so effectively negotiated by this great union, are paying the price. And I think one of the major efforts that we must make is to put, build in the controls to cut down costs, and I'm making a series of recommendations in that regard that'll give us the maximum care, because you and I know what happened when Medicare went into effect, and that applied only to people 65 and over, 65 and over, and we had inflation overnight, did we not? 65 and over. What do you think is going to happen between age one or birth and 65 if we don't have built in the means by which we can avoid the duplication, the waste, and the high cost of these drugs, which are outrageous? We're going to do something about it. And I think we must do those things as we set up the program to make it useful. Well, you know the overriding issues in this campaign. It's a gross mismanagement of our foreign policy. It's a gross mismanagement of our economy. My Lord, we've had seven years on a roller coaster, biggest debt accumulated in the history of our republic, over a fourth of the entire debt since 1789. Think of it. And they say Democrats are spenders. And that debt is a measurement of the number of people out of work. We're $600 million under Jerry Ford's current budget. But we got this huge deficit because when you have 1% out of work, you lose $16 billion in revenue. Twelve of it is direct revenue and $4 billion that takes to support those out of work with supplemental unemployment benefits, welfare, food stamps. Our people want jobs and in a Jackson administration. In a Jackson administration, they're going to work. We're going to build the schools, the hospitals. Yes, rebuild the penal institutions, too, in this country that are 100 years old. They're letting them out now as fast as they send them in. If they send one in, they've got to let them out. And they're outmoded. First offenders shouldn't be in there. So on. We can build sewage disposal plants. We've got a long list of things. And may I say in the energy area alone, under a Jackson administration, we're going to have a program, which we've started now, despite Mr. Ford, ERDA, Energy Research and Development Administration, that'll exceed NASA. It will put, yes, tens of thousands of your people to work in the research and development area in energy to make this country self-sufficient. So never, never again will we de be, be dependent on any foreign oil cartel that would like to blackmail the United States of America. We're going to put our people to work doing that job. Mr. Ford, of course, doesn't have a program. 
He didn't even recognize we were in a recession a year ago. He was calling for tax increases, you remember? The 74 campaign surcharges. I think he's getting his economic advisors from his ski instructors out in Colorado because everything's going downhill. <laughs> you know, Jerry Ford uh, had an instant replay of his uh, speech that he made the other night. He looked at it and immediately got in touch with the television networks and it demanded equal time. <laughs> you take a look at his advisors and their main thesis is the way you stop inflation is put everyone out of work. And then prices and wages and everything will come down. I say the ones that ought to be out of work are the economic advisors to the President of the United States. The best man he had had to leave, Secretary Dunlap, and he's a darn good man. I've worked with him, a fair man. He's had a good record with labor. They get anyone who's friendly to labor, and they double-cross them and don't want to have anything to do with it. And I hope that labor is never before, and labor really operates. My dad used to tell me that when men are out of work, first thing they do, they'll rush into the union hall, and he was an officer. And they want to fire the business agent first. You never heard of this, I know. <laughs> Get rid of all the officers. Well, when they're working, you have to find them in order to get them to the meeting. Do you understand? See, I don't need to be briefed on organized labor. I grew up in a working class family. I know what's on the minds and hearts of our people. And we're going to put our people to work because without our people, involved in full employment, there will not be, there will not be the money to do any of the things that we want to do, a national health plan, to have a decent housing program, to have a decent transportation program. We're losing over a hundred billion dollars in revenue because our people are out of work. And the centerpiece of that administration will be full employment. Look at the foreign policy. We're all for detente. That means lessening. That's a fancy word they've tossed in to confuse everyone. It's a cover-up. It means lessening of tensions. All I can see is that it's increased it tensions. I voted to cut off this crazy program. They started in Angola, but it, facts are the Russians are increasing tensions in that area increasing tensions in the Middle East, increasing tensions in Portugal, increasing tensions in Italy, and so on. Now, my idea of detente is say to the Russians, look, you want some help, you can't support your own people, 45 percent of your population is involved in food production, and still you can't feed them. In our country, only 5 percent are involved, and we're feeding our people in over half the world. They need science, they need technology, but I'd have uh, a two-way, not a one-way street. When you give something, I'll expect to get something back for our people and for the people who are dedicated to peace and freedom in this world. That's essential. <laughs> Senator Adlai Stevenson and I stopped a deal that Nixon and Kissinger were trying to pull, they, you know, they faded away fast. Twelve billion dollars to invest in Siberia to develop their oil and gas. It's six percent loan. Would you like to get a six percent loan? By the way, what loans do they offer us on things we might want to buy from them? They haven't anything to sell except oil and they won't sell it. And I say, and we said it at the time, let's spend that $12 billion that they're going to spend in Siberia in the United States of America and make this country independent. <laughs> Finally, Jerry Ford's a nice guy. Anyone could qualify for that description after Nixon. 
but we need more than a nice guy to be President of the United States. I believe that my experience in the House, in the Senate, dealing with the domestic problems, whether it's civil liberties, civil rights, whether it's the economy, jobs, whether it's energy, keeping the lid on those prices which we forced him to sign, by the way, and which would have cost working men and women and others $75 more a month. And the only reason he signed it is he has to run in New Hampshire. Because going up in New Hampshire and they double the price of the heating bill, it would be a little difficult. And Gerald Ford finally got that message, just like he switched on New York. He's for aid to New York. Well, Arthur Burns came, came over one afternoon, gave him a little briefing. He went to school again, or did he? Uh, the point is, he handed him a little card and said, well, you know, if New York defaults, over 500 banks will be insolvent. And uh, one of them, uh, Governor Rockefeller's uh, brother's uh, little bank. Which is having <laughs> you know, I mean, it's incompetence in this administration. We need a president who can deal with the economy, who's had the experience and the knowledge. They're all, some of them going around saying they shouldn't come out of Washington. I don't know where Reagan came out of when he got that $90 billion figure that he had to leave up there in the snowdrifts. Because thank God for a press. Some of them are here. We have a national press corps that can ask the mean, sharp questions where these characters who try to come in and snow you can't get away with it. And I say, thank God for the American press. And they start to ask him a few questions, and oh, well, he said, that's just a, you know, a figure of speech, 90 billion that he was going to save. He's going to dump on the states that are bankrupt, take away your social benefits, your social security. The way Ford, in his program last night, or in his budget message of yesterday, has announced his great social security program. You know what it does? It raises the costs on Social Security. It was increased $4 billion when they came in. It's up to $8 billion. It'll go to $11 billion that our recipients have to pay for Medicare, people 65 and over. Think of it. They will end up paying $11 billion more since he took office. And to add it all up, the benefits that will flow to our people, it's unbelievable, but out of 25 million people el eligible, only 25,000 are going to be benefited, and 99.7% of the hospitalized elderly pay more and get nothing more. Now, that's his idea of program. Well, he voted against the whole thing. I guess he's trying to eliminate it. But it's that issue, the mismanagement of our foreign policy and the need to have someone who knows his business, that's a real issue in this campaign. And finally, I want, to bring, I want to bring this country back together again. We've had division from one end to the other. I want to see better relations among all our people. And I believe I can bring our people together. I think I understand the economy. I think I understand our free enterprise system. I understand labor. I understand the problems of finance. I understand the problems of agriculture. And I think this country wants to be brought back together again. And by being brought back together, nothing can stop the United States of America. Here we are with this terrible economic mess with the most talented people on the face of the earth, our working men and women, our craftsmen, our skilled workers, unskilled, are the best in the world. We've got the best scientists, the best engineers right across the board. And we have the greatest material resources. And then look around, everything's in a state of chaos. What it lacks is leadership. And I believe that I can bring our people together, bring North and South together, black and white, parents and children, rural and city, because together we have a great opportunity. 
And I see out there a very bright promise. I see a future that waits to be born, a future of hope and opportunity. And as president, I would offer a better life for our people. I will not be talking to you about a lesser America. We have too many people in that category now, the poor and the deprived and the middle class working people who have been taken to the cleaners and one thing after another. I will be moving in the direction of a greater America and not a lesser America. Some may want to make America good again, and especially after Watergate. Some may want to make America great again, I should say. I want to make America good again, especially after the trauma of Watergate. Because I believe that in the last analysis, our greatness will be found in our goodness, and that's why I'm running for president. Thank you, Senator. And now we'll throw it open to questions. Who is the first? Senator, I'm Carl Porter, Wichita, Kansas. How long has Carl Rowan embraced the American critical of your stand on busing? In essence, he says that your stand is a sellout to the anti busing proponents. Would you care to comment? Yes, I, I was out in Kansas, by the way, yesterday and uh, spoke in uh, at Kansas State University. Well, first I have a 100% civil rights voting record. Secondly, I believe in integration completely. Proof of that is that I've sent my kids to the public schools in the last campaign. I ne needn't remind you, as was pointed out, I was the only candidate who had his kids in the public schools in the District of Columbia. Today I have a son in the public schools, and one daughter has had to go to a private school. Third, or fourth, busing has failed to achieve integration. It's failed because we're getting resegregation. It's failed because we're not getting quality education. Busing has worked in small communities. So I introduced legislation that simply says, that a judge, before he can enter a busing order, must make a finding that if he's going to require busing, then he must find that it will bring about integration and not resegregation. Two, that it must bring about an increase and improvement in the quality of education. And third, that he's looked at other alternatives, other alternatives including magnet schools, vocational schools, uh, technical schools, and so on. And finally, on this point, it's costing too much money when money is scarce when it can be used to help these kids. Can I illustrate? This is the nation's capital. This is where all the pronouncements come on busing. It's 96% black in our public schools. How many Americans under realize that? I think it's a national disgrace. My son uh, goes to Horace Mann. His friend, Timmy Watkins, is bused. My daughter was bused last year down to Hardy. His friend, Timmy Watkins, comes from Anacostia, spends about an hour each way because of the traffic on the bus or almost two hours. <coughs> Timmy needs help. He needs a tutor. Wouldn't it be better to spend that two-hour period after school to get tutorial help so that the kid can come out and go into the job market and get a job? That's what I'm saying. The biggest proponents of busing have got their kids in private schools. That reminds me of that old admonition when you start out with uh, your Sunday school class, protect yourself, you always say, or I did, do not do as I do, but do as I say. 
Now, you know where Jackson stands. I hope you'll get a categorical answer from the other candidates. Some may, yes, I'm, uh, as a last resort, but for, and I think the American people are entitled to it. Now, I support the court orders. I've support, uh, supported every court order. I voted against amendments to try to change a court order. That would be in violation of the Constitution because the court has decreed that busing is a proper tool. All I'm asking now is, is a truthful finding by the court when they order busing, that they also take the evidence and the proof that they will increase integration. And where it's happened, you've had white flight, you had it before, but it's on an unprecedented scale. I want the black children of this country and all children to get the best possible education. Why aren't we big enough to admit that it's not working? Does that answer your question? Other question? Pat Brady from Buffalo. I'd like to ask the Senator, uh, does he think that there is anybody that's running for the presidency of the United States knowing what you must know that's big enough to take on the Pentagon? Now, all of us realize uh, your posture or should on defense, and all of us in this room certainly are behind a strong America. But uh, it would seem that there are more admirals and generals in the Pentagon now when we have less ships and need for generals than there were in World War II. And it would seem that uh, if there's going to be any uh, uh, savings in government and any house cleaning, that uh, the Pentagon leaves a lot to be desired. And a lot of that money could be turned into social welfare programs that this com country needs without, without weakening our... I understand your question. Uh, I have voted uh, to cut uh, the fat wherever we found it. We cut over $7 billion out of the budget. I would point out that Senator Proxmire and I uh, caught the Pentagon uh, paying over a half a billion dollars a year more for jet fuel than the, private air the commercial airlines are paying. It's this kind of thing we have to go after over and over again. And I think uh, the key is personnel. We must not fall behind, I'm sure you'd agree with me on this, in maintaining a strategic balance. Uh, God help the United States of America if we do. And I voted for those cuts, and I think there are a number of other areas where we can cut within the defense budget and still not cut the muscle. I believe that's your point. Cut the fat. And uh, the way to do it is to go in there with a scalpel and not a meat axe and continue to weed out those unnecessary functions that do not contribute materially to the defense of the country. I do want to say to you in all candor that uh, our Navy is falling behind. The strategic situation will depend on whether or not the Soviets are going to take seriously Mr. Kissinger's trip, because I wouldn't provide them any help unless they join with us in a mutual reduction of arms. Now, if you want the big cuts in the defense budget, I can tell you that both sides have more strategic arms than they need. I would say to the Russians, no more green robberies like butts pulled in 1972. Yeah, I left, forgot. He's another advisor of the president. He's a great one. I look forward to the time when we won't have butts to kick around anymore. <laughs> but I just want to say, in more direct response to your question, if I'm president, I'm going to say to the Russians, join with us in a mutual reduction of arms and save billions and billions on both sides, strategic arms in particular. Pull back forces in Europe. And we'll save billions and billions of dollars, in addition to what we just said about cutting waste wherever it is. And I would say to them, we'll provide help. They'd starve without our help. They need some help in science and technology. 
But I would engage in hard bargaining and not this one-way bargaining that's been going on. And anyone who's dealt with the Russians tell us we're damn fools. I'm glad Ford went to China. He heard it firsthand from the Chinese on how to negotiate, didn't he? With the Russians. Listen to Andrei Sakharov, who won all the highest awards, who supported my position towards the Soviet Union in negotiating with them. He was the father of their whole nuclear program, won the Lenin Award two or three times and so on. Solzhenitsyn. Some of these people who know what's going on caution against any drastic downward move on our part defense-wise unless it's a mutual reduction. And that's my position. I want a mutual reduction on the basis of parity, equality, and I want to cut the fat wherever I can find it. And I'll continue to do that. And I've uh, led some of the key investigations in that uh, effort. Ever heard of the TFX? One of the biggest wastes of money that we've ever got involved in, billions of dollars. We couldn't get anyone interested in it. And it went through. Good time for one more. One more question? We've got a lot of meetings in town today. We're just kind of yo-yoing. Well, I, this is a good question. I've asked the past uh, candidates. What's your stand on federal gun, gun registration? Opposed to federal gun registration. That's the key. Look, years ago, I was a band of a small group that voted against the McCarran Act that required all communists to register. Well, you had to be a fool to believe that all communists are going to register. That's like passing a law saying uh, all thieves and burglars will register down at the post office. <laughs> well, the people who are going to register the guns are not the ones who are going out and commit the crimes. And it makes no sense at all. When the crimes are committed, they're committed by people who have stolen the gun in the car, right? And I'm opposed to it. What the states want to do, uh, that's within their severe sphere. And I must say very candidly, uh, such a registration and firearms control thing at the federal level would never work. And it would not get at the heart of the crime problem in this country. You know what the, I'm, Red will tell you, I was a prosecuting attorney in my home county at the age of 26. So I'm an expert. But it was a great experience. I had to try cases from speeding to murder in the first degree. There are two problems, crime in this country. One is the first offenders. We should do everything to save them. Everyone I put on probation turned out to be a good citizen. We're sending a lot of them into penal institutions of hardened criminals, and they become graduated hardened criminals. That's got to come to an end and a public works program to rebuild our penal institutions first order of business and make no mistake about it. I want to help the ones who can be rehabilitated. Now let's be honest. Over half of the crimes of violence committed in the United States are committed by hardened, professional, habitual criminals. Over half. People have to lock themselves in their places with double locks and everything else, while the others are roaming around unlocked. And they're the ones that ought to be locked up. And I believe the judges have simply have not done their duty. There ought to be mandatory sentences for the habitual. I'm talking about the one who's committed rape and robbery and assault over a period of many, many offenses, in for a few months, out, in for a little while, out. If over half of your crimes are violence, a violence are committed by them, they ought to be locked up until we get a solution. Now, that may sound a little hard-nosed, but uh, I'm a realist. I'm a compassionate human being on the one hand for those that we can help, and I'll walk the extra mile any day. But for those that you can't do anything about it, why don't we be hard-nosed enough, hard enough about it to do something about it? 
We don't think enough about the victim. We spend all of the headlines talking about the poor accused and not a word about the victim and his family. You got me started. Thanks very much, and I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, they chartered in, uh, in uh, they chartered Delaware, and they operate up in the Twin Cities. And they operate. And I run into the stockholders. Look at the books. Uh, see who the other stockholders are. And they may be go to all rigmarole. I couldn't do it. I had to uh, take the stock out of a brokerage account, put it in my wife's own name. Then we had to say, saying why we wanted to look at the stock hold records, up hand, hold up our hand and swear that this was the truth, hold up our hand, you know, all the things, the, uh, law. Delaware Corporation uh, uh, law. Well, I went through all that, and I did get finally in the book, but it's, it's important, I, I think, for people coming in and as as to follow through as uh, stockholders of this uh, and try to uh, track the uh, uh, this is exactly what this Alexander had in mind. He made a very prophetic statement saying that if we in the United States go along with this idea of one share of stock, one vote, we'll soon. He was so we'll have effective control. So he was so he right. <laughs> so what he proposed so what he proposed was a system of weighted weighted as a under the person as a person's holding in a particular company would increase. Would diminish his voting power would diminish. Actually the way he would uh, after uh, and the person had 200 shares, but they would have 30 votes under his weight of voting system. That's the maximum that um, individual would have. That every individual would have. No, that, that isn't a very radical idea. That's not no, that isn't nearly as radical as that idea of one man, one vote, that we have a cooperative. Government, and that we use in government. So why in hell should corporations be permitted all these separate permitted special privileges? Permitted special privileges. I have to have a well, who else? Well, what's the leadership role? Can we structure in corporations to the size of bringing them down to the size of banks to the opening them up to the democratic process? To the no more. Permitting them to the no more privileges than individuals, no more or accorded to individuals. No more but I commend our such a program to you for our bicentennial year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Vic, for insight. Thank you very much, Vic, for that penetrating insight into what goes on behind the scenes. I think our those who were here last year will recall those who were here last year, the very uh, presentation we had, dynamic presentation we had from the speaker who dramatized the imbalance there is in our country in terms of uh, income and wealth, disproportionate Uh, one I think that uh, must be examined before we even decide how we can react to the program commended by our first speaker. I think it's safe to say that both of these gentlemen this morning are liberals. And I suspect when I say that, that immediately there are some hackles in this audience that go up because that's become uh, something of an unpopular word in recent times. And I think that's because of the very problem 
to which our speaker will address himself. The problem of identification, and what it means and how it relates. What it means. Eminently well qualified to do so. He's a scholar, an author, and he's a graduate of an institution up in Wisconsin that's always had a favorite place in the eyes of the IAM, the University of Wisconsin. And uh, his whole lifetime thus far has been devoted to the study of working people and their problems. He currently serves on the National Committee for Full Employment, which is a uh, an endeavor sponsored by unions and other social groups to bring about some revision of law in our country which will get on with the creation of full employment. He's the editor of the Full Employment News Reporter. His work has appeared in many publications, including the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Nation. And I'm anxious to hear what he has to say about today, working people and their role and identification today. Join me in welcoming Mr. Andrew Levinson. First, I would like, thank you. First, I would like to, I would like to say one thing. I don't consider myself a scholar in any way. I, that somehow I think when you say scholar, you mean someone who's up there in the, in his ivory tower and is relating to the real problems that are going on. I think, in a way, to be is more or less, what I've tried to be is more like a, something more like a private detective. You gotta, there's a problem, and you've got to track it down. And I think what I did, the first book I wrote, was really just looking at where are working people today, what's the situation. And when I wrote that, it was in 1972. And I said a couple of very things that I think most people really know, that most people in this country are working now. They work in jobs and factories, construction sites. They're working people. Just, these always are, as the conservatives will say, the backbone of the nation. True. And so then when you look further, you find that if you look at the, the gap where you are in relation to other people in society, you find that working people still are way below the... Um, the other groups in society. You still have a tremendous gap in income. For, for example, the, um, you know, you know, it's said that uh, black income is 60% of white income. And that's always given as an example of a great difference. But the difference between blue collar workers and white collar workers in America is 77%. If you drop out some, some group who really are working, you find that there's literally a 60 percent, that blue collar income, blue collar income is literally about 60, 65 percent white collar. So the working man has, has advanced as the country has advanced, but there's still a tremendous and a basic inequality. And I just, you know, I start with that because I think, you know, I it's important to look at that when we try and look at the question of what's going on in the economy. And because we really have to start from the everyone fact that really everyone talks about the economy as though it's something which just runs itself and you don't really understand it. But the economy is people and the economy is the way unions relate to companies. It's a, very, it's a real practical matter. It's not some abstraction. It's taken, it's taken me a long time. I've been working for about a year with a full employment committee. And what I've tried to do is go around and cut through the jargon and say, look, put it in language that I can understand. Put it in language that people can understand. And you find that when you do that, you get a very different picture of problems like inflation or unemployment than if you just listen to the kind of, well, what uh, President Ford has said, for example. Take the, really one of the basic things we're facing. They say you have to have unemployment to cure inflation, and this is uh, this is really the basis for government policy. I went to a conference a while ago, and you know it, it takes it takes some nerve to grab an economist and say, "Now look, talk English." But I took this guy and I said, "Now look, will you explain to me what that means?" And he says, "Well, you have to understand. Well, you have to understand. There's this thing called the Phillips curve, which is for every it's just a graph." And for if you have so much inflation, you have so much unemployment. And he says you have six percent unemployment. 
if you have low inflation, you have two percent unemployment, you have high inflation. I said to him, but France for many years has had lower unemployment and lower inflation. He says, well, you see, France has a different fill. But now we have inflation going up and unemployment going up. He says, well, the Phillips curve also shifts to the left. <laughs> what you find out is that there's an awful lot of fancy language that covers up some, some really basic, basic truth. I think the first basic truth about our situation right now is that this recession is not like the 30s. It's unlike, in a way, all of our previous recessions. It was planned. A consciously designed and planned recession to throw people out of work. And it's, it's really the first time a government has ever come out publicly and said it. We're going to throw a couple of million people out of work. The reason is, they say, that that will cure inflation. Only it does. We've seen it. For when we had unemployment in 1970, 5%, we still had high, the inflation kept going up. An increase in unemployment didn't get rid of the inflation. We now see we have the worst unemployment since the year 30, and inflation still climbs. There are, when you break it down, you find they're really saying something else. And they say, we have to trade off full, full employment for inflation. They're really saying we have to do, because there's a trade union movement that won't let us use strike breakers for lower wages anymore, we have to let the government do it for private enterprise. So what you really have is a strategy which says, if there's enough unemployment, if enough people are out of work, if enough resources are idle, then pretty soon wage rates are going to go down. And this is very, uh, George Meany said it several months ago. He said, this is the first time he's heard that since the 20s. But these, the economists who work with the Ford, the Council of Economic Advisors, say this flat out. That, that is the purpose of this recession, is to lower the standard of living, because that's an environment in which companies can function better. If you look I think over the years, I think the, the striking thing is happening. Something is happening in the economy. I think we are coming in a way to a rather critical point. For many years, we were able to have a fairly steady growth in the pie, as it was called. And the story was always, you don't have to redistribute the pie. The pie grows so everyone shares. Well, that was true, and to a large extent, it was based on the uh, things like um, our relative strength in the world, number of factors. But that era has ended. That period is, is ending. And I think that presents us with a real challenge. How are we going to operate in a world where you won't be able to have a pie that expands? Every year. Well, I think I think the trade union movement, I think the American people need to have a plan to deal with that because business has a plan, and that's the plan we're operating. That plan is very simple. It says if if we are not going to be able to grow profit, and business has to stay exactly where it is, and it has to come out of the working people of this country. For example, you have an increase. In inflation due to uh, an increase in the price of oil. The argument is, okay, your standard of living has to go down in order to adjust to that. No matter what the cause of the inflation, the standard of living of the American people has to be dropped to deal with that. And you can see it across a range of issues. For example, they're now talking about, oh, the problem is these massive social programs, and they try and give the impression that they're talking about welfare or something. Big social programs of social security, unemployment insurance, and other programs that are basically <laughs> used by all of us when we get old, when we get sick. So what they're saying is, let's take some money from the sick and the old, and that'll help. Then there's another qu another point they're talking about now. It's called a capital fund. They say we need 15 billion dollars in tax relief. Corporations they need a tax cut of 15 billion dollars because we need money to grow. So they're really saying, again, we have to pay, the American people have to pay more taxes in order that business pays less, in order that the economy can continue to grow. 
across almost every issue, there's a very clear understanding. If we're moving into a period of slower growth, it's the American people that have to do all of the software. And I think the unemployment we have now is really the worst. The other single example where you can see other countries just don't do that. Everyone talks about Britain. Everyone talks about Britain. Everyone talks about the sick man, the terribly unhealthy country. They've had an unemployment rate half of ours. In that sick and unhealthy economy. They still manage to do better than we have on unemployment. In France, they've had tremendous, very low unemployment for years. In virtually every other European country, every other major industrial country in the world, they've done better than we have. And the reason is really a kind of political dedication that came after World War II when we passed the Full Employment Act of 1936. Most of your other countries also had similar things, only they lived up to it. They said, we will not throw people out of work as a tool of economic policy. That's an unfair, cruel way to solve economic problems. And we never made that. What's happened? We never made that. And we, on the other hand, never really made that decision. The Employment Act of 1946 says maximum employment and purchasing power, which is a license to run wild. As long as what is maximum employment? Right now, we have the maximum employment that we can have, supposedly, that's consistent with uh, supposedly, low prices. But what I'm saying is, across a whole range of issues, across a whole range of areas of our economy, there's a basic decision which has to be made, which is, what kind of country do we want? What, what kind of, of distribution of the things we make every year do we want? We can have an unfair one, or we can have a fair one. It can be with a few, we can have a, a society with very few rich people and more and more people becoming more, uh, even uh, more poor. Uh, even, uh, these are things that aren't decided automatically. The economy in 1929, you could look at it and say, gee, I don't know how it works, it's a mystery. But right now, we, in our economy, it's essentially planned. The government, through tax policy, other kinds of policies, essentially is planning the American economy. They're doing it, but they're planning it not in the interest of the American people. It is entirely possible through, for example, um, the right combination of policies to have much lower unemployment than we have now. You want to control inflation? There are dozens of other places you can go to deal with inflation aside from throwing workers out of work. But these are policy questions. These are basically political questions. And we've been given a rigmarole, in a sense, that says somehow or other we just have to sit back and if unemployment goes up, we're stuck. There's nothing we can do. That inflation is insoluble. Well, none of these things are insoluble because they all come down to a basic question. Really, the division of the pie. Who gets the bacon? And I think what we're seeing now is going to intensify in the next couple of years. It's going to be an attack on the standard of living of the American people. You can see it in New York. I was up there several months ago. Um, what is going on with the money crisis in New York is very open. The bankers are very open about the fact that they want to break the union. That's one of their objectives. They say, we don't want those guys having that kind of influence in city government, and we want to, we want to watch them knuckle under. And they're doing it. Just to give you an example of when you say, in whose interests are people operating? Arthur Burns, Arthur Burns, the head of the Federal Reserve, said he wouldn't give any money to New York, which actually at the moment pays out more to Washington than it gets back. So he said, no, we won't help the city of New York. Not only that, they sold these bonds just to kind of get through the crisis. He said, we're not going to insure those bonds. They hit down in trouble selling them. We're not going to insure those bonds and protect the people who buy the bonds. What we will do is if the bank buys the bonds and the bank loans into trouble, we'll help the bank out. In other words, that's that is a policy decision. He's saying we, the federal government, is dedicated to helping the banks of New York, not the people of New York. Now, it's not easy, and there are it's not easy, and there aren't any simple answers to how do you deal with inflation. But when you get down to it, what is inflation? 
There's a nice simple answer, which is when you have either. It's really a question of distribution of the goods. Every year, the country produces a certain amount of goods and services, and people have in various people have get various amounts of them. Inflation is when a company raises its price, so you get less. Car costs three thousand dollars. You can't buy the same car you bought two years ago. It's really a question, finally, of distribution. Of who gets what. And I think this was shown up back in 1946, back in 19, very dramatically, in the GM stuff. In the the time, Russo at that time said, "We believe GM can give us a 30% wage increase and still make a profit." And um, not raise their prices. At that time, and that's what he took to the bargaining table. At that time, there was still price control over from World War II. And the company said, who proposed that? And the company said no. He said, OK, open the books. Let's have it out. If you're going to call us inflation, if you're going to say that our wages are inflationary, prove it. Open the books. Of course they didn't. No company ever had. And six months after the strike was settled, GM got permission from the government to raise its prices. Well, right there, you're looking very dramatically at one of the key sources of inflation in the country, which is without competition. Every time you get a wage increase, the company can raise its prices, and you get on a treadmill. If you look over the past, the whole post-war period, labor has really been fighting, in a sense, a battle just to keep ahead of the inflation. Every time you get a wage increase, the prices go up. And I think what is coming, what is coming, because we're no longer in quite the easy position we were years ago, I think what we're facing is a government policy which says your living standards are going down. And they're going to do it through a variety of means. And the question is, how do we fight this? Because that doesn't have to be the way it's done. It doesn't have to be. There are ways. Really, to say what's a fair distribution? What is a fair share? And you can sit down and you can work that out in collective bargaining. You can work it out through the government. You can say there's a fair, a certain amount is needed for business, a certain amount is needed for the government, so forth. It can be worked out. Right now, the question is what they're really doing is an old divide and rule kind of strategy. It's a little bit here, it's a little bit there, it's very hard to see. They blame, for example, they say social programs. So we cut some. Maybe we cut those. They say it's greedy labor unions with their inflationary wage demands that are the problem. So they make an attack on the unions. They say it's the, um, well, I won't go on with that. But the point is, we have to look and say, how do you deal with a strategy? Which says in every area you can, we're going to be pro business and anti labor and anti people. I think the answer has to be something that I think the labor movement knows better than anybody else, which is unity. As long as everybody tries to get his own little share, it's very easy to run to run these kind of games. If kind of games. We say yes. Um, it's social programs are the problem, and we can cut. No, we take income away from our own problem. You take income. If you say it's unions that are the problem, you take income away from work. You say um, all these various points. Taxes. Our tax structure right now is virtually regressive. Um, I think everyone has heard about the 26 millionaires who paid no taxes. But it goes even further than that. The net effect of all taxes is not progressing. A, w a working man pays at least the same, if not more, than someone who makes more money. So we actually have a regressive tax structure. But what the government is now talking about is making it even more unfair and reducing the taxes on corporations even further and basically widening the gap between people even further than it's ever been done. And I think only the, sun, the way to do the only way that can answer all of this is through the political system. It's through the kind of power. The kind
kind of politics. The kind of political strategy that says no. We are not going to accept this notion that everything that business wants, that business gets, that every reduction, every problem in the economy that arises is paid for by working people. This, I think, is more a question of politics than of economics, because the economic alternatives are there. There are the mechanisms and the means to do anything we want with the economy, in a sense. The real question is, what do we want to do, and who are we going to put in the White House, who are we going to put in Congress to defend those interests? I think maybe the most critical question, well, just go back a second. Right now we have economic advisors in Washington who 10 years ago were considered sort of funny little men on the outskirts of the profession of economics. They were considered the, the, um, the trogger of the cavemen of economics. They're now running our government policy. I think right there we see something. A diff just a different president and a different council of economic advisors will make a difference. A stronger and a more progressive Congress will make a tremendous difference. We're now faced basically with vetoes consistently. Every social program that's been proposed gets vetoed. Job legislation gets vetoed. Gets vetoed. Job legislation gets vetoed. Ultimately, I think ultimately I think we have to figure out a strategy which says it's the people as a whole who have to get a better shake, a better deal. And I think when we look at the political system, what happened in 1972 really was a disaster because the different forces who have to stay together in order to make any progress fell apart. We were divided six different ways. We were divided six different ways. I was at the 72 convention, and I remember being stunned by really how, by how dumb some of the McGovernites were. They had no idea. Some of the McGovern staff people had no feeling for labor, no understanding of working, working people's problems. And I was really struck by that. But when you think about it, it's not strange. We have been separate for a long time. And I think the challenge that faces us now is to get together. Because black people and white people face the quote unquote the liberals and labor have very similar economic interests. We're all talking about the same kind of legislation, about the same kind of goals for this country. What's missing has been an understanding and an alliance based on a clear program which says this is what we want and we all are going to benefit from it. That's the basis of any sound alliance. And I think this is what has been lacking, and I think this is what has to be overcome at this time. We have to start looking at a political coalition, which is a majority of the American people, who have interests in common. And that coalition is, is obviously the working people of this country. That's the majority. And it's their interests that ought to be represented in Congress and by the president. At the moment, because it's been divided, we have a president who's using advisors totally committed to business. Advisors totally committed to that point of view. And, maybe, and I think maybe the most important thing that's going to be happening in the next couple of years is going to be the struggle to put our politics back on, a, on the right kind of basis. The basis which says the political system is supposed to represent the majority of the American people. Let's get a candidate who's got the program that talks to the needs of the American people. It says people come first. I guess. I guess. I guess. I don't know. It would be hard to really say. I, you know, we're all in the same position in the sense we're at the racetrack, but we haven't got a horse. I don't know what what the candidate would be. But I think more important than the candidate is an understanding both of the issues involved and of the politics involved, which is. There are economic programs, there are economic alternatives that can reduce our rate of unemployment, that can control our rate of inflation, and have an equitable distribution of, of um, income in the society. This can be done. And I think the point is, what we need is not a new theory of economics, a new idea. We need a new politics to put into 
affect the kind of program that would be right to for them. I think CIO action program, which they put out several months ago. Excellent document. That alone would have done a tremendous amount to get us out of the position we're in at the moment. And I think we have to start looking beyond to the to putting these kind of economic issues into the political system. To start fighting it out, and I think maybe the most important thing to start having people going to those delegate selections and seeing as much of a broad representation of American people as possible. Of American people. But I guess above all, all the main point I think is something, as I say, that the, the labor movement understands well, which is unity. If we allow ourselves to be divided, if we allow them to say, well, we're going to nibble away at this social program, we're going to veto that bill, we're going to cut income in this area, we will, and everybody tries to go it alone. We will never have the kind of or the kind of econ economic situation that we want in this country. I think the basic point is to recognize the common interest that we all have and to start getting candidates and start getting a political process that reflects those interests. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I presume, like the preceding speaker, you are willing to answer some questions if there are any. Let's start right down here in the front. Let's start right down here in the front. Let's start right down here. to comment briefly on that and uh, to comment in terms of uh, we're middle class, why so many of us think we're middle class when in fact we're starving to death. First, I'd like to say, in regard to what you said, I think you can see the practical application of this question of unity in the committee I'm working for, the National Committee for Full Employment, and you can see the the National Committee for Full Employment was formed last year. It has Murray Finley, the head of United Men Clothing Workers, and Mrs. Martin Luther King, its co-chairman. And the biggest difficulty we face is you have to find an answer, not that just works for a small group, not that works for one sec section of the labor movement, or even just for the labor unions, because there are an awful lot of unorganized I think we all know that during the wage price war, the unorganized took it on the chin even more than the union. That even though the unions didn't got a raw deal. The question is, you have to look at all these competing, what seem to be competing interests. Blacks need jobs. Many, you 
Uh, the black tremendous black 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 youth unemployment rate for blacks is 40 to 50 percent in many cities. Labor, at the same time, yeah. labor, in many cases, the real, yeah. real income of the production worker today is down to the level of 1964. Yeah. So yeah. I just read in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago the net assets, the value of people's houses and the things they own, is back to the 60s. Level. You have tremendous competing interests, and the biggest danger is to come up with an economic program that doesn't, that doesn't find the answers for everybody. I'll just give you an example. One obvious solution to the problem of unemployment is to get rid of unemployment and a compensation. A lot of people go back to work at $1.60 an hour so they don't have unemployment compensation. That's one of the answers that, the, that businessmen have come up with. Keep the benefits low. Make it hard to get those things. I do. A number of my friends are unemployed. And I'm sure you all know what, I mean. what an incredible bureaucratic mess it is to try and get unemployment compensation. It can take a month. It can take two months. It can take a month. It can take two months. These kinds of issues, these kind of strategies can divide us very easily. It's possible to say, it's possible to come up with a number of, pro of really proposals to solve unemployment that really just redistribute and don't solve it. Share, share the work, take less hours. I think that's a beautiful hours. thing when people do it voluntarily it to share a problem. But it's as being proposed by a lot of economists as, gee, that's great. We'll make the, uh, we'll make the employed workers pay for the, the problem of unemployment. We'll shift the burden of unemployment onto the employed workers. It's, these ki it's this kind of divisive strategies that are constantly going to be thrown up. And I can't even begin to talk about all the different economic proposals which basically shift the problem from one group to another. Make the employed workers pay for the problem of unemployment. Make the unemployed workers you know, solve the problem of inflation. Playing off various groups against each other. In the National Committee for Full Employment, what we've tried to do is define the kind of program gives that makes it in everybody's interest to be for that program and to work for it, to vote for the kind of candidates who'll support it. Although we haven't yet written, it has task forces we have working on, it hasn't yet prepared its report. In principle, it can be done. You can come up with a number of things. The allocation of credit, for example. If we have a shortage of capital, okay, we use as efficiently as we can. You don't have it, you don't send it overseas while we've got people unemployed. You don't use it for the kind of projects which don't create jobs. Things like that. Credit control. Another one, you reform the tax structure. You can create a million jobs for eight billion dollars. We could get enough money to employ three to five million people yeah, million people just by enforcing the tax structure that we're supposed to have. We don't have to have re we don't have to change that tax structure. If we just close the loophole, we could have enough money for three to five million jobs right there. We could have enough money again. Um, credit allocation, tax reform, the economy is planning. The, as I said, the economy is already being planned. I don't like the planners. There are a number of things we can do in terms of, for example, our educational system. We were mass producing teachers while the, uh, the baby boom was over. So we now have a tremendous number of teachers who can't find jobs. Well, somehow or other, that is not, doesn't seem that difficult. That you could look ahead five, ten years and say, hey, don't produce teachers, or you're going to have a lot of unemployed teachers. There are a number of strategies like this, all of which, many of which are in the AFL-CIO Action Program, all of which deal with this idea, how do we all move ahead fairly and equitably together? I'll turn you in. Working class and these names. I think, in a way, the whole notion to say, um, I am middle class or I am working class is a very dangerous thing, a very important thing, even though it doesn't seem like it. Because the way you define yourself also tends to define who you see as your allies and who you see as your enemies. When you say, I'm in, I'm in the middle, it sounds, it has a sound. Watch out for the guys below me, and I gotta watch out for the guys above me. I'm kind of fighting both sides. When you look at what the answer is, 
When you look at what does middle class mean in this country, when you look at what the, there are figures that the government put out called standard budget, which estimates the um, how much it costs to live, the kind of life. There's one which is called the lower budget, and pretty much what you need to live, what most poor people have in America. There's an intermediate budget. It's very clear. You look at the kind of goods you can own. The kind of budget a working man lives. And it's about the average worker. It, for 1970, the average worker was making about 9,500. I think that was after. I forget whether that was before or after. But, and the budget called for 10,300 or 400. So in other words, the average working man is a little bit below. So in other words, that average that budget, which just said what a working class life is. The middle class budget, the upper budget, in 1970 was $15,000. I'm not sure what it is now. So what do we mean when we say working class and middle class? If you're talking about life, we know perfectly well. The guy working in a shop is not living like a doctor or a lawyer or a stockbroker. But these are different groups of people. They are very different economically. But I think but I think the most important thing is not the words. I'm a working. But I think it's what they signify. Because if you say I'm a working man, what you're saying is I've got the same interests as every other working man. I've got the same. I've got the same basic things. I want a job. I want decent income. I want my kids to have a chance to get ahead. I want decent income. And I got nothing against any other working man. And I think that's the important thing. When you say who are your friends and who are you, it's really saying who are your friends and who are your enemies. I think the question really is, we, oh, the labor movement has always talked of unity, and we've always said that we're all brothers in the trade union movement. But I think what has to be done now is to recognize that all of the American people, all the working people of America, the employed and unemployed, black and white, young and old, and so forth, really have the same interests. And I think that's the importance of talking about being a working man in America. Sledgehammer, but I'll, uh, I'd love to drive that thumbtack with a sledgehammer, but I'll uh, refrain for a few moments to get a couple more questions. But I'll, uh, let's get uh, Freddie first and then you, Stan. Let's get uh, Freddie first and then you, Stan. Uh, <coughs> two things that are uh, going on right now, one is primarily. Nobody <coughs> even at it as the Federal Reserve. And farther along this year than finally, and farther along this year than ever before is the right path to tax marriage legislation to provide for a GAO audit. Papman didn't get a ruling. Uh, for this bill, it's not at all sure uh, that we will have that. We may have hearings on it in our committee too next, uh, uh, next month. One of the things you need is a public audit. The, the people who are the real governing boards of different regions are really help decide regions. And these are the people who really help decide financial policy are, uh, by law, one major category are the bankers themselves. When we are putting the federal uh, third thing, when we are putting the federal advisory committee act through, when we are putting the federal uh, to get and, uh, to the Fed has these advisory committees, we have to accept in order to get the uh, the law exemptions from the act and its open meeting provisions from that. The two agencies, the CIA. CIA, the way up, you know, Burns brought up, the way up to a leading member of Congress said we can't be, uh, uh, better say we can't be, uh, we can't open up like that, and it was uh, accepted as a condition of getting it on. The other, Senator Troxmeyer, who is chairman of the Banking Committee, has proposed that when he 
about a week ago, the reorganization of banks have regulations. We now have three different bank regulatory agencies, the Fed, the control of the currency, the Federal Deposit Insurance System. He would propose they'll be getting at a hearing onto a one single bank regulatory structure, and that, of course, would, if it becomes law, take away some of the independent features of the Fed. I mean, it's absolutely true. The exporting jobs. You can look at the other side. The importation of workers. I was amazed. They they now estimate there are seven million illegal aliens in the United States. Now, you can't convince me that those were all guys who were who smuggled themselves in as a without some sort of involvement and very strong involvement in business. Those workers were brought in here very consciously because they would take low wage jobs. Because they you undercut wage you don't, allow them so you don't suddenly wake up one morning and discover there are several million people in the country who you didn't want in the country. This was, again, the exporting jobs, letting low-wage workers come in, are all part of the same pattern. I think the same thing. All these various kinds of... Um, uh, no, yeah, just... Incidentally, another one. We had one of the craziest transitions of, our of any developed country of our agriculture, our people who were on the land and came into the cities in the, in the 40s and 50s. The mechanization of agriculture for millions of blacks. It's one of the biggest migrations in history. The migration of blacks who were living on the land to the cities. You had the mines, the mechanization of mines, which threw hundreds of thousands of miners into the cities all of a sudden. That's one of the reasons, uh, just again, a comparison with Europe. That's one, of the, that's one of the reasons why they don't have the same kind of problems. They there are going to be jobs, for example, in certain areas in France. They can project that there are mines that are going to run out of coal in five years. They tell, I was just reading, they told Renault, they told, you're going to be building a new plant. Put it there, because there are going to be some guys out of work five years from now. This is part of the government's, it's called indicative planning. It's a voluntary thing where, the, where they just sit down and work out obvious points like that. Something's going to happen. Let's respond to it. Let's get ready. I think the thing, though, that ties all this together is a very... There's one basic fact, and that is they... If you can make more money someplace else, business will go someplace else. You, I mean, it's silly to say it here. All of you are here trying to deal with the way plants move their jobs around to get lower wages. It really comes down to how much control you have to... How much do you, how much, how can you put it? How much do you let them get away with, in a sense? What are the limits of social responsibility? Do we just say anything that's, that makes a profit is fine, even if it throws workers out of work? Or 
supposedly say, you know, in a, in a, in a civilized country, there are limits to what you can do. You can't go run overseas. You can't bring in low wage workers. You can't throw people off the farms in this unplanned, chaotic way and not make provision for them to get other jobs. I think one of the big problems we have now with unemployment, one of the big problems precisely what the fellow back there said, is that we have a tremendous number of people who need the kind of jobs that got the Irish into American society, that got the Italians into American society, and those are precisely the kind of entry jobs, the jobs that get you started, that have been undercut by the export of jobs and really and changes in technology, where it's much cheaper for us to go right across the border. I think 300 plants used to be in the United States. Very good from a business standpoint, but from a human standpoint, terrible. And I think what has to be considered is all of these factors really come down to the same basic question of do we say, do we make the kind of commitment that other nations made after World War II? They just said, and it was because their people made them say, the government made that kind of said, you know, we just will not permit high unemployment. If we have to make other adjustments, Lower. If certain things don't get done, okay. It's a civilized country doesn't have these percent of people out of work. America never made that commitment. And I think the first step that cuts across all the specific economic issues is very simply to make the government pass a bill that says unemployment in a country like the United States is as backward as a twelve hour day. It's as ridiculous as child labor. We don't have what we need is the political will and the political force to say, okay, now we're not going to have it. If other countries can make that commitment, so can we. But if other countries can make that commitment, we arrive. I don't know. We arrive close to the lunch hour, and I feel constrained to exercise the prerogative of the chair and make a couple of additional comments on this line of inquiry. So. So let's uh, skip any more questions. Let me simply say this. Our problem is one, as has been said, of first being unified, and secondly, speaking out and making books with all similarly minded allies wherever and whenever we find them. Now that sounds like a ridiculously easy order, but it isn't. Because we have, by some of the conduct of our movement, some of the programs that we've pursued, and because of some popular misconceptions that prevail, because of some popular estranged ourselves and alienated ourselves from a lot of people who could be and were willing to be allies if they were properly approached and understood us better. So, A, we have to create a better understanding, and that can only come from the top. Uh, we have a malady around known as being too old to do certain things known as being that prevail in the, in the top echelons of this movement today. As long as Mr. Labor of the United States of America content to get on national TV and say the American labor movement has attracted all of those who are willing to join us. We are 13 million strong big enough to do the job, and anybody that doesn't want to join us doesn't have to, and it creates that kind of a negative climate within which to expand our ranks first internally, within which to cause us a grave disturbance, until we can but we've got to try to step around that program, until we can solve it by changing that intellect, until we can solve it, and we've got to try to find some way to sidestep that and do the job within our house with everybody that thinks the way we do and believe it or not. That's most of them except him. Secondly, I think we have to understand what the hell we're talking about when we talk about being workers, average Mr. and Mrs. America, call it what you want, middle class, call it what you want. We did something a few years ago at a convention of our union which gave me uh, grief insight at that time. It suddenly became very unpopular to refer to things such as the class struggle. 
connotation in this society of ours because that had the automatic connotation of being an advocate of some ism that was unpopular or unworthy. So we removed the words from our in our Constitution. We removed the word class struggle. As though it no longer exists. As though we're one big happy family in the good old USA and everyone prospers together. Well, I guess you know. That might have been a mistake. Well, I guess you know. I guess you know above that that it's a myth. What you heard today alone. That class struggle. Just on what you heard today alone. Is as real and alive and as vital today as it's ever been in the history of this country. And alive and that we still should. And even though we can wear a decent sport jacket, we got to be out in the trenches fighting with the goddamn thing on to keep everybody, somebody from owning everything else. Damn thing on because pretty soon the sport jacket will be gone too. And we'll be fighting the same way we always did. Bare chested. And we can't be fighting. And those are the stakes. And we can't. Above the problem. saying we're middle class Americans. We're above the problem. So we're not going to share with them because we don't know how to turn it on. So we're not or we're going to turn our back on for any number of other reasons and cancel out programs that are designed to help them because they're shiftless or indolent. We can't, by that process, turn anybody's thoughts away from the opposite kind of bigotry such as George Wallace represents in the political conscience of America. Such as George Wallace. And that's what a lot of people have done. a minority government lost. We're paying the price for having a minority government lost. Richard Nixon was elected by a minority of the American people like because of the political interference of the third party. Something like 42% of the vote put that man in the White House. With a 20 year record of being a thief. The American people, 42%. And they overwhelmingly put him back there when he continued to improve upon his record against burglary in 1972 because they didn't like the kind of liberalism portrayed by the other candidate on that occasion. All look over your shoulder and decide whether you'd rather have that burglar or the visionary that you might change your mind today if you happen to vote for the burglar. Because we're paying the price because we're having government by minority by veto right today. One third minority of the Congress, one third of the United States government, one third of the democratic process is ruling our lives. One third of the democracy. And that's not the kind of an America that I was taught about when I grew up. And any time an administration can march over to that Congress with a budget which shuts off every program that has jobs, every program that has any social value, every program designed to help people on the basis that this country can't tolerate a federal deficit, and I say to you, whoever believes it has been caught in the I say to you, this country had its greatest day. Climax. We enjoyed our day. Days. Climax, our epitome as Americans. Days. In days Climax, of high death. Corporations in this country day after day after day go out and borrow up to a half a billion dollars at a crack. They don't sell assets to get the money. They go borrow it. And they borrow it on their station, the future of that corporation, not only to continue to make profits and pay the debt, but to continue to run the system under which they're living. And they have that much confidence in their future. United States have in the future. How much confidence does the president of the United States have in the future of the United States when he says we can't go a penny over $60 billion and we don't care what that means? Nine million people are going to walk the streets looking for jobs. That's not the kind of an America I know about. The kind I know about is you borrow whatever in the hell it takes to get the job done and make this a viable society where everybody can work, be willing and able and want to. By having a bright future that this country can provide. So you say, okay, how can we provide it? Well, this gets into a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. But I'll tell you just one way that the reservoir of unmet needs we have as a nation, and the reservoir of skills and unworking hands that we've got available, idle hands that have talent, there's a whole host of things upon which we ought to be going to work and spending whatever it takes to go to work on them system of taxation and some other fine tuning of this instrument called the government will put back into the federal coffers and eradicate the deficit. Japan, a nation without one drop of oil. As a national heritage. A nation without one drop of oil. Not one drop of oil. It gets 40% of its hot water heat. It's heated hot water. It's rooftop solar heaters. What do you hear in this country? 
else. You heard Mr. Reinemer talk about it this morning. You don't hear it anywhere else. And I say to you, if right today, anywhere else, we put the idle hands of American workers busy making rooftop solar heaters for every home in this country, jobs, we'd save a couple of million barrels of oil every day to sunshine, and the price wouldn't be half as much as unemployment those idle hands to sit around and it would also lessen our dependence oil companies that already own us and that's why it doesn't get done there's a massive noose around our necks if we all get and I suggest to you we've got the knives if we all get together and throw it in the melting pot which we can create one big enough to cut that noose but it requires disciplining ourselves a little bit Confidence in the institutions called our unions, our Consumers Federation, and a few other entities that are around to challenge these corporations to control this country. And the only ones that can go out there and create institutions is us. That kind of confidence in these institutions is us. Nobody else is going to do it. And as long as we have people sit around talking about their unions and everything else, we have people and all of the little private problems that go on every day and over to a total program, a total declaration of war against this news. So I commend that in thanking our guests for their input into that kind of a scenario. I commend what they've told you as a program. I commend to you some, some serious thought about where we're at and how we got there and the kind of renewed dedication and cooperation is going to require from all of us to get out of it. Is over. Get out of it. So if you want to say that's a warm up, that's what it was. Uh, our speakers, that uh, worthy, worthy, worthy purchases, and I would be kind enough to measure the support of the IAM to pursue that program. And we'll do it without any hesitation whatsoever. Promptly at one thirty, and uh, we'll get a report from our research. Report from our research.